So, good morning, everyone. Um, welcome to the third day of our conference. Um, so, um, I'm the junior chair of this first morning session of Thursday and co-chairing with uh, Professor Blakesley Burkhart over there. And, um, yeah, so our first speaker today is Risa Wexler from Stanford. Yeah, so Risa, please take it away. Thank you. Uh, let me start by just thanking the organizers of both the conference and the workshop because it's been just tremendously stimulating and exciting. And I've learned a lot uh, both this week and in the last few weeks. It's been, been really, really fun. Um, so I'm going to change gears from what most people have been talking about here and I'm going to talk about essentially what we can learn at the very limit of galaxy formation, both about galaxies, reionization, and uh, dark matter. Um, so I'm going to talk about the smallest galaxies and then things even below the smallest galaxies uh, and how we get at this. So I don't know why this isn't advancing. Okay. Um, so the questions I want to try to address in this talk, um, what is the galaxy halo connection for the very smallest galaxies in the universe? Um, can we actually detect the minimum mass at which galaxies uh, start forming? Can we detect dark matter halos ideally even below that mass? Um, and what do those small halos uh, tell us about uh, the physics of dark matter? So uh, lots of collaborators on this work, but I especially uh, want to uh, acknowledge Ethan Nadler, my former student uh, who now at Carnegie and USC, who is my lead collaborator on the dwarf galaxy stuff, and Sebastian Wagner Carena. Uh, who is currently at Stanford and is soon moving to NYU and CCA, uh, who is the lead collaborator on the strong lensing piece of this. Okay, so um, ma many of you have seen this plot uh, multiple uh, times in the, in the conference. And here, I want to focus, I don't know why my, okay. I want to focus really on this very low mass end where this plot in my review article uh, just got messy and, and even petered out. Um, and in this talk, I'm really going to be focusing way down here, maybe from, you know, halo masses of 10 to the 10 and lower and even off the edge of this plot. Okay, so really to try to understand, you know, what is the slope of this? What is it scatter at low mass? What happens when you don't have galaxies anymore? Um, We'd like to really detect the minimum mass at which galaxies form. And one interesting thing, if you think about the history of this field over the last 25 years or so, is actually, I think we used to think the minimum mass was a bit larger. Um, so the earliest papers on what reionization might do to galaxies indicated that essentially all halos below maybe 30 kilometers per second would be suppressed by reionization. Um, this is an example from a more recent model. So what's being plotted here is the fraction of halos uh, that would have a detectable galaxy um, as a function of halo mass, showing you how changing the reionization redshift could, could potentially change this. So that red point is a limit, and I'll tell you more about that limit in this talk. Uh, we'd really like to you know, measure that uh, and see what this looks like. And then ideally, we want to actually detect halos through some mechanism below that mass. So just to remind you all about what we sort of know about CDM, right? CDM predicts a power spectrum. This is the power spectrum as a function of wave number. And here we see some actual measurements from lots of different probes, including uh, CMB and galaxies. And I just want to remind you all that for the purposes of structure formation, CDM is really an approximation of any real model, okay? And so here we're plotting what we call CDM. Um, and we can think of that, you know, as uh, in the context of structure formation, it means that the free streaming length of the particle is small enough that it doesn't impact structure formation on any measurable scale. And it means that the interactions between dark matter and itself or dark matter and protons or electrons also don't impact structure formation. But you can see here that the error bars don't go down very far on this plot, and there's lots of things that could be happening with dark matter that would change this on smaller scales. 
Okay, so there's a range of models that are that look identical to CDM on the scales in which we have measured them and look different from CDM on smaller scales. Um, you can see wave number here, but also halo mass here. So you can see that, you know, below like 10 to the 9, stuff could start to be different. And we haven't really measured this. And so we'd like to be able to measure this. You can see most of these models that are plotted here reduce small scale power, but there actually are also some models that increase small scale power. And so these are all things we'd like to be looking for. Of course, the thing that makes this hard is that we need to distinguish the physics of dark matter, the, the physics of dark matter that might do something to really get rid of the halos with the physics of galaxy formation. And so here are some examples of things that could impact small halos. So here are some examples from a uh, dark matter example. So lots of different models that could impact this. Warm dark matter, fuzzy dark matter, ultralight dark matter, self-interacting dark matter, late decaying dark matter. These are all things that either lead to fewer substructures, like you see in this plot, or uh, you know, differently distributed substructures within a halo, or even differently distributed dark matter within uh, the substructures themselves. Okay? So these are things that we want to look at, but we have to be careful to distinguish this from things that galaxy formation can do, and these are just three examples, right? Reionization can basically mean that some halos don't form galaxies. Um, can be that even, you know, in, in halos that are, you know, 10 to the 7 to 10 to the 9, lots of things can happen. Supernovae, massive stars uh, can uh, change the profiles of halos or uh, destroy them entirely. And the existence of a disk, which is somehow sometimes not properly accounted for, especially in dark matter-only simulations, but may not be properly modeled in hydro as well, the existence of a disk can impact satellites, can destroy them when they orbit. And so these are just three examples of things that can happen, and ideally we want to distinguish these from each other. So lots of ways we can measure small-scale structure, and uh, these are six of them. In this talk, I'm only going to be talking about the first two here. I'm going to talk about dwarf galaxies, and I'm going to talk about strong lensing. But I think the next decade is really, really exciting because I think a lot of these things are going to come together and have quite independent probes of small-scale structure that will really be able to test lots of systematics. Okay, so jumping into the dwarf galaxy piece, right? So here we're thinking about galaxies that are anything from, say, 10 to the 3 to 10 to the 9 solar masses that live in halos, as I'll, as I'll highlight, that are roughly 10 to the 8 uh, to 10 to the 11 solar masses. And these are just some images of some of the dwarf galaxies uh, that we know of. And as most, most of you probably know, there's been a huge revolution in detecting these things within the Milky Way in the last decade. Uh, st well, actually starting with Sloan, but then quite accelerating in the last several years with DES, PanSTARRS, and several other surveys. Um, these things are, of course, hard to find. So this is an example of what one of these images looks like. The actual galaxy is these stars. And so you have a complicated uh, thing of detecting these things from the background. So a couple of nice study, which really for the first time uh, did a robust search of dwarf galaxies over most of the sky. Uh, so this is using DES data over one-eighth of the sky and pan stars over about two-thirds of the sky. Um, and uh, we, we found there's actually 40-some galaxies in this uh, thing. You know, uh, some galaxies have been detected since then, right? So these are some galaxies that were detected actually in this white area, which was just not looked at before, and, and this, is, this is ongoing work. So we're really uh, filling in this area, getting deeper across this whole area. So with these data, we did an analysis to try to understand you know, what do these data tell us about the halo population for Milky Way satellites? And the basic idea is really to do a joint modeling of the formation history, the cosmological context, and the observational selection function, and to really jointly model the constraints on the dark matter halos and the galaxy halo connection. Okay, and so this is the pipeline. I'm not going to go through the details just for time, but basically, you know, we simulate some halos directly, 
we populate them with galaxies, we apply an observational selection function, and then we calculate the likelihood of that model, um, constraining uh, both the halo population and the connection between galaxies and halos. A uh, short bottom line from this uh, result is that there isn't a missing satellites problem, as far as I know. Um, the model is an excellent fit to the data, so the model based on CDM. Um, but we actually really can't explain the data without the presence of an LMC. And I think this has now become clear from many, many lines of evidence. The satellite population uh, of the Milky Way really requires thinking about the LMC, something like 25% of the detectable, uh, detected satellites um, uh, came from the LMC. We actually get really similar results on how many are LMC associated from this analysis as you get from a totally independent analysis from Gaia. Um, and so, uh, so that's really nice. Okay. And the other thing is that we expect that there's a lot more things out there. This, these searches have not yet probed the entire Milky Way halo. So what do we know already about the threshold of galaxy formation? Um, so this is basically the result we got from this analysis. So this plot is a similar one to what you saw before. This is the fraction of halos that host a galaxy as a function of halo mass. And the basic conclusion is that essentially all 10 to the 9 halos have to host a galaxy. Otherwise, you can't explain these counts. And even at about 10 to the 8, um, some of those systems must be hosting some of these ultrafaints. So I would say what, what, you know, the conclusion is basically that the faintest systems that we have already detected are probably in halos that are a few times 10 to the 8. And at least half of the halos at this limit host a galaxy. Okay. Um, so there's really no evidence yet for a cutoff in galaxy formation uh, due to either reionization or some other feedback or due to a change in the dark matter halo profile itself. Okay, and just to say a little bit more about this analysis, right, we're really sort of jointly modeling um, things that are uh, related to the galaxy halo connection, you know, the faint end slope, the scatter, and things that are due to the dark matter physics. So the mass scale that, you know, would be suppressed due to dark matter physics. Okay, so this already tells us something about dark matter, and just to say uh, what this analysis looks like, right, we, you, different dark matter models will suppress power on different scales, and that will lead to a suppression in the subhalo mass function. So this plot is showing how suppressed is a given non-CDM model compared to CDM, okay? And the basic conclusion of our, of this analysis is that at a few times 10 to the 8, the observations are not consistent with anything that suppresses the subhalo mass function by more than about 25%. So they're fully consistent with CDM, and they're still okay if you suppress it by a little bit, but if you suppress it at this mass more than about 25%, you're already ruled out because you just don't have enough satellites. And one thing I just love about this analysis is it's so simple. We're not trying to do anything fancy about the properties of the galaxies or anything about that. We're literally just counting, and we say, we found these things. They need to live in halos. Um, and so that's, a, that's really nice. Okay, so that already puts some really nice constraints uh, on dark matter. It puts constraints on warm dark matter, interacting dark matter, fuzzy dark matter. But I think, moreover, you, the main thing you should be thinking about is it really constrains any model that suppresses halos, and really any model that suppresses the, the, the dark matter mass function can't really have any impact uh, above 10 to the 9. Um, and uh, so that's, that's already quite a strong constraint. Um, and there are, so we have a warm dark matter constraint that says warm dark matter has to be greater than 6.5 kV. Um, and that's similar to other constraints. It's a very different set of assumptions, and I think that's really, really useful. Okay, so I want to just talk about getting one step further to actually detecting the minimum mass. This is just speculative work in progress. The bottom line is I think it's likely that we can really measure this minimum mass this decade. Um, the first thing to say is that pinning down the massive end of the, of the galaxy, of sort of the low mass end, so 
things that are in, uh, you know, galaxies that are, say, 10 to the 6 to 10 to the 9, that already can really help break degeneracies in this model. It's not very well constrained right now. I think we already have a huge number of galaxies that can constrain uh, the galaxy halo connection in that regime. Actually, I just got off a call looking at lensing um, for galaxies that are 10 to the 8, 10 to the 9. I think we have a beautiful measurement of that, so that's already a really nice uh, thing. But um, so Saga, which you heard, okay, uh, you heard briefly about Saga. There's other surveys that can do this. The main thing I want to leave you with is that each, each halo that we detect at the very lowest mass uh, really already improves the limits. And LSST will dramatically improve these numbers. Roman uh, could, could increase it by an order of magnitude. So I think this is really, really exciting. Um, okay, skip that, and I'm going to move on to the strong lensing piece. Okay, so let's imagine that in the next decade we actually, you know, really map out what are the halos that host the very smallest galaxies, and we think, you know, we've measured this cutoff. Can we actually detect halos below that limit? I think it's a very exciting possibility that we can really do that robustly. I don't think we've done it yet. Um, we have detected halos uh, that not from their galaxies in strong lensing, but not below the limit of galaxy formation. I would say the detections are right now in the regime of 10 to the 9 solar mass halos. Okay, so, um, <clears throat> so as I said, dwarf galaxies should allow us to measure this cutoff, and then the dark halos below this cutoff I think are detectable by at least two methods and probably more. Um, gravitational lensing is one, and perturbations in stellar streams is another. I'm just going to talk about the gravitational lensing piece of this and what we're doing along these lines. So the basic idea here uh, is that you've got a lens here uh, at some intermediate redshift. You've got a source behind it. And the thing you're trying to do is detect the substructure around this galaxy. Right? And the basic idea is that this source galaxy gets distorted by the, by the large amount of mass in this host galaxy, right? These are relatively massive galaxies, maybe 5 times 10 to the 12 uh, solar mass halos. But they have substructures in them, and those substructures slightly distort this thing, okay? So those, if you change the subhalo mass function, you change what this image looks like. Okay, so there's actually a lot of signal in this image, but you can see that this is not necessarily an easy inference problem. Um, one of the things that makes this inference problem hard, of course, is that, uh, you know, even for a given subhalo mass function, different draws from that should give you, uh, you know, different, different kinds of images. Um, so we want to actually set up this inference problem so that we can use all of the HST lenses that exist. There's roughly 100 HST lenses right now. We are in, we are entering an era where we're going to go from a number of similar to 100 to a number more like uh, 10,000. Uh, so we really want to be able to do this problem on a large number of lenses uh, with really robust inference. So we've been working on a methodology for sort of simulation-based inference um, from hundreds of lenses. Right? So one by one analysis is really not practical anymore. We really need to forward model each, uh, each system and do simulation based inference on that full sample. So very roughly, the procedure is, so in this paper we, we, um, described simulating about half a million, uh, images. Then using those images to train a neural net uh, to estimate the posterior of the lens parameters and the subhalo mass function parameters directly from the images, okay? So going from the image to the parameters we care about, right? The parameters on the subhalo mass function and the lens parameters. And then uh, step three, you know, on observed lenses actually combine those uh, individual posterior uh, constraints to constrain uh, the subhalo mass function. Okay, so that's that's the procedure, and in this, uh, in this paper, uh, led by Sebastian, we showed on simulated data that we could get unbiased results on a sample of about 100 lenses. Actually, going to slightly more data does start to give us a biased result, um, but that's, that's the one thing that we're 
actively working on right now. We think this is a solvable problem. So we're currently working to apply this to a large HST data set. This is Sebastian's thesis, so I'm hoping it's going to be done by, by May. <laughs> um, so stay tuned. Um, and the really exciting thing is that right now there's no evidence that the analysis is data limited. So we really think that we're still limited by actually the modeling itself. So we're really limited by slow and small uh, training sets. And so we're working on this fast differentiable simulator to extract uh, the most signal. Um, Sebastian spent last summer at Google and he made uh, an, an infinite number of progress so that we can basically do this with an infinite training set or an effectively infinite training set. And uh, just as of last week, it looks like we're, we're almost there. Um, I'm not going to show you results and I was told to stop talking. Um, so I just want to leave you with this sort of high level message. Um, we're really getting a lot of data on, actually I checked, to, as of today we have spectra of something like 40,000 dwarf galaxies from DESI. Um, really exciting and, and lots more will be coming from these beautiful imaging data sets in the next decade. I think we have the potential this decade to really detect the minimum mass for galaxies to form and then ideally also to detect dark halos, evidence of dark halos below that mass, which you know already is teaching us a lot about dark matter, but we have a lot of room uh, to go there. Thank you. Right. So um, before we go to the question session, uh, I would like to remind you that every time before you ask a question, please say your full name. Yeah. All right. Okay. Dalio. Thank you very much, Lisa. Uh, it was super interesting. Dalia Baron. Uh, I wanted to ask about the uh, strong lensing. Uh, how easy is it to distinguish between the mission of the lensed galaxy and its spatial distribution, which may be very weird, uh, and the subhalo mass function? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so I, I think we actually can distinguish. In order to show that, we need to actually make sure that our simulated images are as realistic as possible and actually look like you know, the galaxy distribution does. So that's, of course, one of the biggest challenges. In the published paper, uh, we used Cosmos galaxies. Um, and so they are quite realistic, but we don't know for sure that they're representative of that high redshift population. Um, there are tests in the paper that show we basically can make this distinction. Uh, and, and also that we can actually distinguish between halos that are along the line of sight and are in the halo itself. So those are things that we do think we can do. But um, really pinning down the realism of the images is one of the things that will need to happen you know, as we uh, make this, you know, really do this on real data and understand our error budget. All right. Um, yeah, Christian Jespersen, Princeton. And so um, in, when you talked about this initial project where you're populating you know, the dwarf galaxies um, or dwarf halos with galaxies, how exactly do you populate those dwarf halos or you know, those halos with dwarf galaxies? Like what's the method you, you use to do that? Yeah, so this is a statistical galaxy halo connection that has a bunch of parameters. So we have parameters for the uh, slope uh, um, and normalization of the galaxy halo connection, for the scatter in the galaxy halo connection. We have parameters for what the disk does to disrupt the subhalos. Um, and you know, so it's a, it's a parameterized model along those lines. Thanks. Yeah. Hi, Reza. Um, this is Lena Nasib. So um, thank you for the talk. I was just wondering, um, I think you skipped, you went through it a little bit fast, about the bias in the lensing. So yeah. um, can you tell me a little bit more? Like, what, what, uh, I was a bit confused about the, uh, why the results were getting biased by a higher number. I don't think we fully understand why they're biased, but I think it is because of limited training data. And so, um, you know, uh, yeah, we, so I think in this analysis, we showed that two of, you know, a hundred lenses, it's not biased. Um, I think what, what we think we need to do to get to the next level is just a lot more training data. And we've already, um, not published yet, and I don't have clean plots, but like it already looks like that is the solution. 
um, that really we just need a lot more training data to be able to push this further. Yeah, um, yeah. hi, that's Pablo from Montreal. Um, very interesting talk. I was, I'm very curious about the inference part of it. Um, so what kind of um, SBI method or architecture are you, are you using? Yeah, um, I, I am unsure whether I can answer that question uh, correctly. <laughs> um, I mean, you know, essentially we um, we are, you know, sort of simulate, you know, get, trying to map these observed images to the posterior, and then uh, and then do this hierarchical inference. I can definitely talk to you in more detail yeah, about be, it offline. That'd be great. Yeah, um, and I'm also curious. Um, I guess it's kind of related, but. Um, are you, so in, in, we work in this learning the universe collaboration and one of the main issues we face is model misspecification. So our simulations are not yes. like the data. Um, do you have any ideas on how to mitigate that? And that's because we also are lacking ideas. So. I don't know if I have generic ideas about that. I mean, we are thinking hard about how to make sure that our model is flexible enough and also that I mean, there's, there's two key pieces of it for this problem. One is essentially like modeling the subhalo mass function itself, the lenses, and all of this sort of line of sight situation. That's one piece of it. And the other piece of it is the source galaxy images. And this is a key thing that we're working on improving now. Um, in, uh, and so, yeah, those are all pieces that we're, we're thinking about. I don't think I have a generic answer to that question. It's a really good one. I would love to discuss that more. It's always a long shot, yeah. Thank yeah. you. Hi, thank you. That, yeah, that was wonderful. Jessica um, Sarkenberg. Uh, yeah, so my other question got already uh, answered. Uh, but for uh, the lenses, my, um, I, I haven't followed the field, but my understanding was that it's very challenging to go beyond subhalos that are basically in the Einstein ring, uh, because also the the, uh, the galaxy, the Lansing galaxy itself, and its stellar distribution is going to matter if you want to go down the subhalo mass function, basically. So, how do you go around that? So, yeah, because so you so, have very little other information about. The lensing galaxy, the, the yeah, the lens galaxy, not the one that is lens. That's right. So the parameters of the lens galaxy are part of our model. So that's the first thing. So that is jointly constrained. The second thing to say is that we are most sensitive, and this is generically true with these, um, you know, with these kinds of analysis. We're most sensitive to subhalos that are near the Einstein radius. And so getting well within and also going well out is actually not easy, as you say. Uh, but, I, but I think as long as we effectively model that and, and, and understand how that maps to the other regimes, I, I think that's probably the best we can do with these kinds of systems. Yeah. There's one in the back. Uh, hi, this is Sabrina Apple. Thank you so much for a really interesting talk. Um, I just was wondering when you're looking for these smallest galaxies, what is the cutoff, if you will, for what counts as a galaxy? You know, is one star enough to count as a galaxy, or is it a? Yeah, no, that's a that's that's a great question, and um, I don't have a clean answer. So when I say smallest galaxies, I really mean smallest detectable galaxies. I would say that the smallest galaxies that we know of are very small, so like a thousand stars, not one star. Um, you know, probably there are halos that are quite a bit lower that have one star. <laughs> um, but I think, you know, I'll be pretty happy if we kind of can really robustly map the halos that host a, a thousand uh, stars. That'll, that'll be pretty good. So I think we're at time. So yeah, please um, ask the question offline. Yeah, all right.